Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Julie, and I'm speaking with Shireen Chaudhry from the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Professor Chaudhry is an assistant professor of behavioral science. She studies how people navigate social interactions and relationships with others by examining patterns in how people use language and speech acts when they communicate with one another. Her research has been published in journals such as Psychological Review, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, Current Opinion in Psychology, and many more. She is here today to talk about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Chaudhry. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you start us off with a general overview of your career path, specifically from college to becoming a professor at the University of Chicago? What were some of the steps between getting a bachelor's degree and then becoming a professor? I started off at MIT getting a bachelor's in science, specifically in brain and cognitive sciences. So that's like neuroscience and some cognitive psychology mixed in. At that time, I actually didn't know that I would end up in academia. I actually was aimed towards going to medical school, but I sort of realized I didn't necessarily want to do that. Um, So following my bachelor's, I actually got a, a master's at Cornell in health administration because I started to become interested in more like public health systems level kind of interventions. I was always interested in like health and helping people improve health wise and realize how important kind of economics was in that story. So uh, while at Cornell, I took for the first time, I took courses in economics and then in behavioral economics. And it was kind of this eureka moment that you can combine psychology with economics and kind of get these predictions about human behavior or understand how and why people kind of behave in certain ways. I just really liked the idea that, you know, there were patterns behind people's behavior that like could explain a lot of people's behavior. So after that, I decided that I I wanted to pursue a degree in behavioral science or behavioral economics. So after that degree, I started sort of researching the field, reading a lot of articles, preparing to apply to grad school. And in the meantime, I got lucky, actually, a friend kind of recruited me for a job in neuroscience, which I had a background in, in Berlin, Germany. So, you know, I was in my mid-20s and I thought, you know, I'm in the middle of the transition in my career. So, you know, what better time to just kind of take some time and go live and work in a different country and kind of work on transitioning. And so that's what I did. So for two years, I worked at the Max Planck Institute and I was situated in Berlin, lived there for two years, did neuroscience research, a lot of fMRI work, um, while at the same time studying up on and reading behavioral econ, behavioral science work and applied to schools. And then came back to get my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. That's where I worked with my mentor, George Lowenstein, who was one of the founders of behavioral economics. So it's sort of like a, you know, kind of a dream to work with him and learn from him. And after five years, then I went on to do a postdoc for three years at the Wharton School um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And that's where I worked with Howard Kunruther. And in the meantime, just sort of finished off my job market paper my dissertation work. And from there, I got the job at University of Chicago in the behavioral science department, where I am today. And can you give me a brief overview of what the research that you currently are doing that you've been doing at the University of Chicago, what do you study specifically now? So I'm broadly interested in how people navigate these social interactions, but I'm especially interested in how they do it via communication like language. So for instance, I'm especially interested in in how people navigate conflicts using things like apologies and how different psychological forces, for instance, prevent us from using apologies or lead us to show certain patterns in our behavior around apologies. For instance, like not being willing to apologize to someone unless you thought you would get an apology in return. And to kind of study these different forces, you know, develop hypotheses about specific interactions and run experiments. So those experiments can involve kind of online surveys and participants or participants in the lab here at the University of Chicago, 
We also have this great lab called MindWorks, which is on Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago, and we recruit people through the street. And then it can also involve looking at interesting data sets that can help me answer a question, you know, whether that's, you know, something that's available online or something that you can kind of like scrape. For instance, I have one data set from TripAdvisor where we look at how managers respond to customer complaints on there and look at the different components of apologies that they use and examine how effective it is in satisfying customers. So there's like a wide range of, of things I do to investigate these questions. That's very fascinating. I'm curious if you were to think of yourself when you were younger, even like middle school, high school, early college, what were topics that were interesting to you or even activities or things you like to do that might echo some of the things you study or some of the things you do in your career today? Can you look back at your younger self and see any foreshadowing to the career that you would end up having? Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit, right? You don't get exposed to these topics really in traditional elementary and high school curricula. But like I was always into math and science. So just thinking about things in a more analytical way really appealed to me. And I, I thought I wanted to do medicine. So I was really interested in biology and things. But I would say like in terms of concrete things that I did, that was as close as it came to foreshadowing. But I think what made me realize that this is the field I wanted to be in was just realizing that on my free time, I just tried to understand why people did what they did. Like I was just constantly thinking about these questions, like reexamining social interactions, trying to understand why people in one context behave a certain way and differently in another context. And when I realized that I did that more in my free time than thought about medicine or being a surgeon or something like that, I realized what I needed to do. Like, it just makes more sense to do the thing that you're kind of naturally drawn to doing in your free time. So, and I think, you know, from a young age, I was always probably people watching, examining, trying to understand people very deeply. It's always something I've been interested in. You mentioned a couple of particular mentors you had throughout your early career, and I'd like to hear more about them or anyone else who was really influential in determining your career path. So can you tell me about some of the most influential people in your career? Yeah, I'll tell you about the two people that were kind of influential in getting me to kind of switch from pursuing medicine to pursuing behavioral science. And, and those were two individuals at my master's program at Cornell. Kosali Simon, who is a behavioral economist, uh, studies Medicare and things like that. And then um, William White, who was also an economist, a uh, historian of economics, I think. Um, anyway, so both of them were faculty in the program that I was doing, the master's program. And they like just through conversations with them, you know, like I took classes with both of them and did some research for Kosali's class. And both of them had kind of talked to me about kind of my skill set, or they, they sort of encouraged me. I think they gave me just positive feedback on the fact that I had good research skills and um, that I asked really interesting questions. And I remember a specific conversation with Will White, you know, where I was telling him I'm applying to medical school. He, he was like, you know, I think that you probably should go to grad school rather than medical school. And I asked him, why do you think that is? And he said, well, I think like out of all the students we have, you're one of the people who asked like some of the most interesting questions in class. And it just seems to be as a way that you think, I think grad school would actually be a better option for you. And that really like nobody had ever told me that directly, something so direct about my career path like that. And um, it really made me think, and I think because I was already kind of questioning that path and being becoming very enthralled by behavioral economics that I really started to reconsider my path and talking to Kosali about it as well. She was really encouraging. So I think both of those faculty really helped me change my direction. That's great to have someone really like identify an issue that you're thinking about yourself and, and give you that sort of guidance. Yeah, which is really rare, I admit. Like that is almost never does somebody straight up tell you something like that. Like, oh, I think you're good at this and this is like a really great path for you. So, yeah, I felt lucky to have somebody be so honest with me. Were you met with any resistance in your early career or even now, maybe from 
a family member saying like, no, you shouldn't change your path or just any any challenges that you face that ever made you doubt yourself in the career path you've had? Yeah, so 100%. So my dad is Pakistani, so I'm half Pakistani and uh, he grew up in Pakistan and like, I think it's very common with South Asian families that there's a lot of encouragement to either become a doctor or a lawyer, right? And I think, I, I think I never realized <laughs> that that may have been one reason I was thinking of medicine as my path was that like my parents really didn't talk to me about the plethora of careers out there. Like I really didn't know that people could become professors. I never even thought about that. I was like, oh, this is the path you choose if you like science. This is the path you choose if you like words, you know, lawyer, doctor. So, you know, as I was evolving and learning a lot in my educational journey, this was starting to change. And once I made my choice, my parents, especially my dad, were not that happy. They were, I think, very concerned because they also, I think, were not very familiar with all the different career paths for highly educated people out there. And so I think they were concerned, you know, would this be a financially viable future? Will you be able to kind of like take care of yourself? And so I think a lot of potentially a lot of the students listening to this might uh, identify with this of tension between what they want to do and, and potentially what their parents think. But at that point, I didn't doubt myself. I was very confident in my path forward. So like there was a period where I really had to pursue that without my parents being as much on board and like supportive of it. I just knew that I had to do it. I had enough, I think, professional support and people around me encouraging me and things that, that that helped. You know, I think if I had faculty telling me, like, what are you doing? It would have been a lot harder. But eventually, I mean, my parents, you know, once they saw how many grad schools I got into and which ones, they were super proud, right? And kind of once they learned a little bit more about the field and the opportunities of becoming even just a researcher, like if I were to pursue becoming an academic faculty member, like there, there's just like a lot more opportunities for PhDs than they realize. So I think educating them on that really, really helped. But I myself was determined to kind of pursue that path. We've been talking a lot about how you got to the place you are today, and I want to shift now to focus more on what you are doing now with your career. First, I want to talk about the experience of teaching and being a professor, because there's studying your field and understanding your field, and then there's actually communicating that to students and engaging with with students. Can you tell me about the experience of becoming a professor and why you wanted to go into a career where you would teach and research instead of just researching? Okay. So like, I think people can end up in this position without wanting to teach at all, because this is a very special place to do research. If you go to a research institution or something, you don't get to choose what you research on. So people can end up in this position without wanting to teach at all. But, you know, I happen to also want to teach or, you know, enjoy teaching and mentoring students. So becoming a faculty member, it was nice to have the opportunity to teach my own class as a grad student. Some some people do this in their PhD where they are given a whole class to teach, but not in our program. We kind of just assisted the faculty in teaching a course, never had to make our own. So I think I really enjoyed having full control over what and how to teach students because I enjoy doing it and I feel that I have a knack for communicating to students things that are complex and helping them understand things in a way that's much more understandable. So that's something I really like and continue to enjoy and just the sort of immediate feedback of teaching. It's not something you get in research. With research, it's months or years before you can get feedback on a paper, before it gets published things like that, uh, the feedback is few and far between. Whereas with teaching, you get this immediate feedback from students and interactions you can improve over time and things like that. Um, But then also the component of research where you're teaching students is mentoring graduate students and research assistants. And that's also really fulfilling because it also makes you realize as a faculty member, like how much you've had to learn over the years to become a good researcher. And so, you know, kind of conveying all this information to people and also the wisdom that I've learned about how to navigate this kind of the system, uh, this career, like that's an enriching part. I would say that that's that's not something I anticipated being like an enriching part, not like a reason I necessarily pursued this path, but it's definitely a great side effect. What would you say is the most fun or exciting part about being a professor? 
I would say getting to work on questions that I find the most interesting, the most burning. I think not everybody gets to do that necessarily as a researcher, as I mentioned before. And so being a faculty member, having that autonomy to choose the research questions you think are most interesting and try to pursue those, it's great. It's You get to follow your curiosity, right? And to discover the answers to questions you have is really fulfilling and interesting. And then to do it in a way that's really convincing to yourself and others where you you collect data and you support a hypothesis and you just confirm other hypotheses and then you kind of share that knowledge with others that's also a fulfilling part so i think just kind of like pursuing our own curiosities is is the best part of the job and then the flip side of that what is something that you don't like about your job is there something that is not so fun or challenging I think this is probably a part of any job, which is, uh, you know, just networking and strategically navigating the job market. That's not fun. I don't enjoy doing that. You know, so, some people love the strategy part of it and thinking about that, but I just feel like it takes me out of my research. I'd rather just do research than have to, you know, we should be self-promoting our papers on Twitter or, you know, making sure to talk to all the right people at a conference. I think that's the that's the least fun part of the job, but it is something that's, you know, wise to be thinking about and to be doing in, in order to be successful in the career. But yeah, I think that comes with most every job. I want to talk a little bit about your experience working in Berlin. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the value of studying or working abroad and how that has impacted your research or your career path now that you are back in the States. I'm not sure that like, being abroad per se, as opposed to being abroad doing research, affected my career path. I think that it affected me as an individual and how I see the world. And I think that that's important. Not everything should be about forwarding your career path, but also making you a, you know, interesting individual and just like developing your, your understanding of the world. I think living in a different country, I had traveled to like Pakistan and Egypt and stuff before and spent some small amount of time on different trips. But living for two years in another country, I think was a fully different experience, like, you know, having to really establish myself there, develop a whole kind of group of of friends and live in that culture and really navigate it. Yeah, it just opens your eyes to how people function differently in the world than, you know, maybe how you grew up or how your people in your country function. And then also, you know, learning the language and, and trying to become, you know, conversational in German and being there long enough to to actually do that it was it was great like I you know it was a different lifestyle than I had been exposed to before there's just like slightly different things about the way people do things in Europe and specifically in Germany and I decided like oh I like certain things and then I like imported stuff back to my life when I moved back to the U.S. so like I, I think it just kind of potentially broadens your horizons, makes you more empathetic and understand in a concrete way, you know, how people, that people function differently in different countries, but that there could be other ways of doing things that you actually would would like to do as well. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it necessarily affected my career path or the way I do things in my career, but it definitely allows me to appreciate people coming from other countries, I think, and, and just like how people might do things differently. And that could be better. What are your current aspirations in your career? What are you hoping to do next? What are you hoping to do as your career progresses? Over the past few years, it's become clearer and clearer what my interests are in a weird way. You kind of like discover your interests as you do research. You know, the more expert you become in a particular area, the more interested you you become in that area. And it just sort of develops on its own. So I think um, really just continuing to develop the theories that I've been working on about communication, about these social interactions and how people use communication. Honestly, so just like to continue the work that I'm doing, to publish more, to come up with new ideas, improve on my existing theories. Yeah, I would say that's my main focus. Like I don't have any aspirations to become like dean or anything like that. I'm not interested really in the administrative roles. Just the dream is to keep doing the research that I really like. What advice would you have to someone who is considering maybe both entering your field or someone who is interested in getting a graduate degree in it and becoming a professor? I know those are kind of two different fields or two sides of of the same field. So if you have two pieces of advice, that's great too. But what type of advice would you give to someone who is considering this field? 
I think specifically if you're pursuing academia, like if you're getting a PhD to become an academic in specifically the field of behavioral science. So I can't give general advice for people who, you know, want to pursue a computer science degree or a PhD in history. But for behavioral science, um, there was also kind of related field. So actually marketing, behavioral marketing, organizational behavior in psychology, various fields within psychology. So these, I think, you know, degrees in these fields are all applicable. I can kind of speak to getting a degree here. In preparation for your PhD, it's very competitive nowadays, I think, to get into the top PhD programs. And you absolutely need research experience, specifically research experience within the field that you're hoping to go into. So you kind of like need to show you can already do the type of research that you're going to be doing in your PhD program. That was not true when I applied to PhD programs. Like, you know, I was doing neuroscience research and then I was applying to do basically behavioral science research. You know, I was able to get a position, but like, you know, within the past 10 to 15 years, things have really changed. So for instance, I think it's pretty unusual for students to be accepted into our program unless they have basically been a lab manager of somebody in the field doing research, running, you know, studies, learning how to use our survey software, Qualtrics, maybe even having some experience programming and running statistics in R or Python, these types of things. So that's super important. Some people can actually get that through their undergrad, so they can apply right out of undergrad. Otherwise, people have to get that experience by seeking out uh, research lab manager positions, research assistantships. So that's something to think about if you're willing to kind of put the time in to do that. And then, you know, as far as kind of pursuing becoming a faculty member, I think that that becomes, you know, you kind of learn during your PhD whether that's something you want to continue to do. So continuing to do research and is that the kind of thing you want to develop your own research agenda and pursue your own questions? I think, you know, in the PhD program, again, it's become really competitive. So it's like a focus on doing the research and getting the publications out as soon as possible. Um, and you'll take coursework in your PhD program. People always tell you, don't don't worry about grades, just do your research, just focus as much as possible on the research, but you have to take these courses. I would say that the courses, the most valuable courses in our field are the quantitative ones. So learning how to run statistics, use advanced um, like text analysis tools and things like that, because that stuff is a lot harder to learn later on. And you just have less and less time over the years. So if you can use your coursework to train yourself on these like technical skills, I think that's the most valuable a way to kind of spend your coursework hours. Yeah. And then I think as a graduate student, the best thing to do is in terms of mentorship, when you get into a program, I always tell students you want to develop a relationship with both a junior faculty member, so somebody who doesn't have tenure yet, who has kind of recently come off the, you know, come out of grad school, and then a senior faculty, because I think that they provide different levels of advice, different types of advice, and both of them are very useful. And usually, like the junior faculty member might be more available to kind of advise you and things like that. So for our final question, I would love to just spend some time reflecting on what is the most gratifying thing about working in your field or about your specific career? What fills you with gratitude about your job? I'm kind of going to just echo what I said earlier, which is being able to pursue the burning questions I have about human behavior and human interactions in a way where I can actually, you know, develop knowledge about that. So I can actually answer those questions using data, you know, knowing that I've found the truth to some extent about a question and then being able to share that with other people and actually basically give knowledge, produce knowledge. I think it feels very gratifying to produce information that other people could potentially use to help them navigate their own lives. For instance, like how do you navigate conflict with your spouse or your friends? Like what are some techniques and being able to kind of answer those questions? It feels great. That is all the time we have today. Professor Chaudhry, thank you for your time and your insights. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Professor Chaudhry, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu. 
or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.